I don't know, it's still hard to believe, like, it's just, like, I still expect him to come home. Tonight, Calgary police say the death of a man from the Pecani Nation was caused by an overdose. His family says he had injuries and his death is suspicious. Sure, the program is highly intimate, um, very emotional, very exhausting. Kids in Thunder Bay are learning about their culture in a new art residency program and they're making friends to help them along the way. I feel actually every night we do the show, it's, you know, it's like sinking in more and more. And a new play by a Mi'kmaq writer looks at the reconciliation process through the eyes of a woman drum singer and biologist. Good evening. Welcome to APTN National News. I'm Dennis Ward. And I'm Melissa Ridgen. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau says his government won't resort to legislative tricks to get the Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion built. But the PM says all options are still on the table. Trudeau is in Edmonton today and set to meet with Alberta Premier Rachel Notley. Notley has called on him to immediately recall Parliament to deal with the project that was quashed last week by the Federal Court of Appeal. Ottawa bought the pipeline for $4.5 billion and Trudeau says if the project was still in the hands of a private company, the court ruling would have killed it altogether. But now that the government owns it, they can move forward, but it has to be done in the right way, he says. Parliament is set to resume next week and the Prime Minister had this to say. We are looking at uh, what an appeal would look like, what it would mean. We are looking at legislative options, uh, and we are also looking at what it would take to actually go through the steps that the court has laid out. Uh, I think we've made it very, very clear that our goal is to get this pipeline built in the right way. First Nation legal wins against resource projects continue to mount. The most recent was last week's ruling by the Federal Court of Appeal on the Trans Mountain Pipeline. Lawyer and author Bill Gallagher has been keeping track of the legal victories, and he joins us now. Mr. Gallagher, thanks for joining us. Uh, you've been keeping track of legal victories for First Nations against resource projects. How many have there been, and what does that say? Well, this one last week is number 264. It, uh, it sits very high at the top in terms of its importance. What it means is, uh, in terms of the last 10 years, uh, First Nations are deciding the fate of resource projects right across this country, and they're redrawing the map of Canada in terms of their land rights while they're at it. So this is a major event for a person like me, and likewise for your listeners. This sort of uh, important uh, uh, game-changing ruling doesn't come along that often. Now the federal government is weighing its options on whether to uh, appeal the decision or find a new way to go forward with this project. What are your thoughts on uh, the potential of this pipeline expansion going through? Uh, well, uh, it, I, I believe the Prime Minister has just said in Edmonton that he's going to work with the ruling and that means not appeal it and not introduce legislation into Parliament. Uh, if, he, if he has said that, and I believe he has, then he's made the right decision because he would not win on the appeal and the uh, Parliament's role would be uh, under attack by uh, any number of interests. So he has really no choice, and to some extent um, he's, he, he's, he's behind the eight ball on this. Um, he's got himself a, a real problem. He's, he's purchased a pipeline that whose permits have been voided, and uh, I consider this project as of today a white elephant. Bill, what does this latest ruling and uh, I guess, you know, the 263 before it say about uh, the future for resource projects? Well, number 263 was a, a win on the duty to consult in the ring of fire, indicating just how dead that region is. Uh, what I'm trying to say and, and have been saying all along is until such time as governments and industry take embrace the duty to consult and not just send note takers that's the mistake this the, the, that's the mistake this project made the government of canada did not respond to the note takers they just embraced the note takers and all these note taking went up the system and they they had a built-in um, 
uh, view in government that they could not touch the NEB rulings, they could not change the conditions, they could not add to the conditions. So I call that legal constipation, that the prime minister has surrounded himself with advisors that reek of legal constipation. Uh, the court called all of those three points wrong. They can do all of the above and should be doing all of the above and doing it in a manner that fully engages, talks back to, listens to First Nations. So this tells me that we are still slow learners on the road to resources. The government deserved to lose this court case, and it has gone down in flames. And it's going to be very hard to reconstruct. It's going to be very hard to pretend everybody can get along now and that, and that this win isn't the monumental win that I'm calling it. Mr. Gallagher, we're going to have to leave it there, but I uh, appreciate you taking some time for us here today. Okay, thank you, Dennis. The rail line to Churchill, Manitoba has been sold, and the line itself, which has been out of commission for a year due to flooding, will soon be fixed. In a community update posted to Facebook, the town said the sale covers the Hudson Bay rail line, Port of Churchill, and Churchill Marine Tank Farm. The buyer is a group of First Nations, Fairfax Financial, and AGT Food and Ingredients Incorporated. We have more from CTV. Woo! A proud moment for a proud resident of Churchill. When flooding damaged parts of the Hudson Bay Rail Line almost a year and a half ago, life got very expensive for the northern Manitoba town of 900 people. Joe Stover is training to work at the local airport. Since the rail line shut down, he says getting rehired at his old job at the port seemed unlikely. With a new buyer, a big sigh of relief. Have people in town not, not worrying about their futures, their children's futures, whether they can make it up there. For the first time in a few years, we'll actually feel like uh, a normal town again. Friday, the town of Churchill announced a deal had been reached to purchase the rail line by a consortium of northern Manitoba communities along with Toronto-based Fairfax Financial Holdings and Regina-based AGT Food and Ingredients, a large agricultural company. Especially Mayor Mike Spence isn't releasing the amount the but the says the deal was possible with, quote, a significant away. contribution from the federal government and gives people in Manitoba's north at least 50 percent ownership. It's really, it's really historic news. Regional ownership actually is part of it. You know, making sure that we're investing in our infrastructure and create opportunities. So we're looking forward to that. Spence says the deal means a full pullout from the line's previous owner, Omnitrax, which refused to fix the track, saying it was too costly. In addition to the rail line, the new owners also take over the port. What we're no longer looking at is short-term fixes for Churchill and that rail line. This is a, a, an organization uh, that's committed to the long term and that can only be good for northern Manitoba. Churchill's mayor hopes to see a team on the ground making repairs next week. He expects they'll be completed within a couple of months before the winter frees up. The province of Newfoundland and Labrador says it is ordering two studies to keep the cost of Muskrat Falls under control. The project has tripled in cost to nearly $13 billion. Premier Dwight Ball says he has ordered the Public Utilities Board to find options other than raising rates for consumers. One of those reports is due this February and the second in January 2020. No environmental concerns were mentioned, nor the implementation of the Independent Expert Advisory Committee's recommendations. Calgary police are reviewing an investigation into the death of a Pecani Nation man. We'll have that story for you after the break, but first, here's a look at tomorrow's weather forecast. We've got 26 in Cloud in Fredericton and Charlottetown, 28 in Halifax. The next track is in at 7, La Grande River 12. We we'll remain 11, cloudy throughout. Shibugamu is 15 with some rain, 32 and rain in Montreal. Valdor, sunny and 18. We've got rain and 25 in Toronto and Peterborough, Ottawa. The capital is in at rain with some 22. Big Trout Lake is in 11 with some rain, hot and sunny in Thunder Bay, 20. Elliott Lake is the same as is Sudbury. Puckatawagans in at 9 and Thompson, 9 as well. Sunshine both places. 
21 and sunny in Dauphin, 29 sunny in Brandon, 25 sunny in Winnipeg. Estevan, 23 with sunshine, 24 in Regina, 21 in Saskatoon, and 20 in North Battleford. Lots of sun down there. 10 in sunny in Uranian City and Stony Rapids, 10 but cloud in Buffalo Narrows, 12 in sunny in La Rage. Welcome back. The Calgary Police Service is reviewing an investigation into the death of a man from the Pekinese Nation. Police say he died of an overdose, but Tamara Pimentel tells us the family of the man questions the injuries they found on his body. Friends and family of the late Daryl Smith gathered outside the office of the chief medical examiner. They say the investigation into his death was handled improperly. I don't know, it's still hard to believe, like it's just, like I still expect him to come home. It's too hard. On August 12th, 47-year-old Daryl Smith was found dead at a residence in Calgary. Police say he died of a drug overdose and declared his death non-suspicious. But his mother, Betty Smith, says his body was covered in bruises and had what looked like stab wounds and a gash on his head. I really believe my son was beaten. Smith says her son was visiting Calgary from the Bikani Nation. She was never notified about his death only finding out about it through word of mouth. If my nephew wasn't in Calgary, I'd never know about my son. Maybe he would have been buried as a John Doe. I really don't know. They didn't even send me nothing from the coroner's office, and yet they're saying it's, it's an OD. You know, not, and I haven't gotten nothing yet, nothing. No communication from these people whatsoever. The Office of the Chief Medical Examiner released a statement to say the OCME, RCMP and Calgary Police have reached out to the family. Calgary Police say a homicide detective has been directed to review the case. But so far there is still no indication from them that the death is suspicious. Daryl's brother Marvin Smith says he hopes the protest brings change for all Indigenous people. I want justice and I want them to look at and take take our case seriously because right now it's just showing a pattern of how Canada deals with Native people, how they deal with our deaths. Tamara Pimentel, ABTN National News, Calgary. A new art residency program in Thunder Bay is helping youth make lasting connections. Our Thunder Bay reporter Willow Fiddler stopped by the art gallery to get this story. It's all about more than just making art. Uh, it's always about giving youth who feel disconnected a chance to uh, come together and talk about what culture means to us. Quill Christy Peters created the Indigenous Youth Residency Program at the Thunder Bay Art Gallery. She said conversations exploring settler colonialism is a central part of the residency. And I'll kind of ground that conversation and how it's impacted my actual life. So I have things that I'll share about my father in residential school, about um, my reserve being flooded, all these different things I kind of have um, to share. For five weeks, these six youth worked with local artists, elders and knowledge keepers. 22-year-old Karina McKay said learning about her culture is essential to her personal growth. We went on the reserve too, and then where we learned how to do spruce root picking, we learned how to make birch bark baskets, and it was like really fun to realize that I kind of like really love that. <laughs> Christy love Peters said the paid residency aims to give young people a safe space to feel connected. Sure, the program is highly intimate, um, very emotional, very exhausting, uh, which I think comes from, um, you know, Indigenous youth aren't really given the space to talk about colonialism and white supremacy, especially in this city. 16-year-old TJ Monroe said it was alienating when he was first moved to the city. I really did feel disconnected from everyone, especially from uh, moving uh, just off the res. So it was a huge change and um, something really to get used to. This collaborative piece is a reflection of their shared experiences. The red dress represents missing and murdered Indigenous women, girls, two-spirit and transgendered. So the snake behind her is a 
manifestation of like colonialism and the colonialism and capitalism, the the plights that we have to go through. And she's turning her back on it. And then focusing on her own personal growth, which is why you see her with the medicine wheel. Monroe said the residency was eye-opening and emotional, but he's grateful for the experience. So I always felt the traumas that I have faced as uh, in in my childhood was always just uh, bad luck or anything. But after with this program, it did help me. Um, I've seen no one to help me heal more to just be able to have that reassurance that um, what happened to me was out of my control and it's up to me on how I choose to heal from that. Christy Peters wants to keep the residency program, which is funded by the Ontario Arts Council, running in the city. Willow Fiddler, APTN National News, Thunder Bay. As kids head back to school this week, some northern youth are staying behind to finish camp. And it's evaluation time for a youth summit that teaches Indigenous traditions. Charlotte Morton Jacobs has more. It might just be the most cohesive camp out there. I, I yeah. And the secret lies in teamwork. 21 teens are being put to task, surviving in the bush. I camp a lot when I'm at home, but we don't have trees where I live. So it's new to me camping here. Inuk youth like Jody Tularek and Karen Anderson are absorbing new bush skills. Learning the different ways that different regions do things. Like, like I find it very hard, like the way they cut fish. Like I, I couldn't get it. <laughs> the Northern Youth Leadership Summit brings 21 youth from the territories, Nunatsavik and Labrador, together for a week. Part of the application process, the kids have to identify three challenges in their community, and then we actually build the agenda around the challenges that they've identified. So it's a really neat opportunity for youth to see that the challenges they're facing aren't just something that's unique to their community, but it's actually across communities in Canada. Well, this may look like fun and games, Later on, campers like Dalton Moore will open up to the group about living in a remote community. Some of the challenges are just like, sometimes it just gets really boring. Like sometimes there's just a lack of activity. You just gotta get out and just, it's basically just gotta get out in the forest and enjoy yourself. For most, the experience has been about friendships and sharing. I wanted to bunk with my people at first, but we get to meet new people and like we can just all like, we all get really close like real quick. Last night in the tent I was talking about one of the legends and the other girl's like oh, my grandpa told me about that who's like from the Yukon and it's kind of cool of like how we're all connected and sharing the dialects like the different dialects from all over. And then the rabbit comes. Oh. Oh, hang the it. youth will return to their home communities smelling of fire and spruce Smells like camp and it's thick, good. And full up on great memories. Yes, yeah, so we have a nice water source and ducks and fish. Charlotte Moore Jacobs, APTN National News, Yellowknife. It's time for another break, but when we come back, a tough break for a Sasquatch hunter. That and more after the break, but first, here's the rest of tomorrow's weather. Northern Alberta, 10 and 12 in high level and Fort Chip sunshine there. Edmonton's in at 19, mix of sun and clouds, same with Calgary. And Medicine Hat, lots of sun in 28. Kamloops, 29 and sunny, Penticton, 28 and sunny, Victoria, 23 in sunshine. Deece Lake's in at 11 with cloud and light rain, Sands Bed, 17 in rain, Fort St. John, 26 and sunny. Watson Lake, 12 and windy, White Horse, 14 in sunshine, Dawson City's in at 10 with some rain. The Northwest Territory, 16 in Norman Wells and Sunshine, Wati, 14 in Sunshine, Yellowknife, 11 and Sunshine. Fort McPherson's 10 in rain, Colville Lake, 10 and mix of sun and cloud, Saks Harbor, 1 with some light rain. Cambridge Bay, 4 degrees, Sunshine, Repulse Bay, mix of sun and cloud, and 7, Arviat, 5 with cloud.
welcome back. Reconciliation is usually talked about between governments, nations, and organizations, but one Mi'kmaq playwright has brought it to a personal level. Angel Moore explains. The play Alabudieg exposes the different views between a Mi'kmaq woman drum singer and a non-Indigenous biologist. Shalan Jowdhury wrote the play to bring people together. We can have these conversations, we can have these difficult conversations, and it's important because we need to figure out how to listen to each other. Ken Schwartz says this is the fifth time he has produced a play by an Indigenous playwright, and it won't be the last. Because of uh, um, some of the culturally specific you know, things uh, that are so important to this piece of work, I think it's been uh, a learning experience for so many people here at the Ross Creek Centre, um, and, and an entirely positive one. Do you give the data back to the community here? The play is set outdoors and the two characters meet each day to count and record endangered birds. Soon they are discussing reconciliation at a personal level. Jowdry's play is impacting more than the audience. Actor Matthew Lumley is learning to listen to different views. I feel actually every night we do the show, it's, you know, it's like sinking in more and more, like I hear more and more of what she is saying. Jowdry is taking the play to Indigenous communities across Nova Scotia and hopes people will listen, talk and learn from each other. Angel Moore, APTN, National News, Halifax. A British Columbia judge has thrown out a lawsuit that aimed to prove the existence of Bigfoot. Sasquatch hunter <laughs> Todd Standing filed the suit earlier this year. He argued the province committed a dereliction of duty in recognizing and protecting the Sasquatch species. Standing feels he has all the necessary evidence needed to prove the existence of Sasquatch. In addition to the case being dismissed, Standing has also been ordered to pay the province's legal costs, but Standing says he is undeterred. This whole case, I went into a, a gun battle with a knife and I got uh, blown away, you know. Uh, I had no idea my evidence wouldn't count for anything. I had no idea that going to trial was all based on precedence. And, uh, you know, I, I, got, I got beat. And, uh, but it's, it's not over by a long shot. I'm just getting warmed up. I got an appeal now. I still believe, anyways. Yes, devastating blow to the field of Sasquatchery. It is. That's all the news we have for tonight, but you can always find more at aptnnews.ca. And with back to school in the air else everywhere, we leave you with a photo a little less jubilant than most. Here's two and a half year old Kenzie looking a little unsure, holding a sign about making her second attempt at daycare. Her mom Rachel posted it on social media along with some others showing that Kenzie indeed made it through the day. Second attempt success. I'm Melissa Ridgen. And I'm Dennis Ford. Have a great night. We'll see you back here tomorrow.